Good afternoon. Welcome to today's American School University webcast, Bridging the Gap, Secrets to Transferring Facilities Management Expertise, sponsored by Dude Solutions. My name is Stephen Averett, and I am Director of Content Production for American School University. Before we begin, let me explain how you can participate in today's presentation. If at any time you're having audio difficulties or slides are not advanced, advancing, simply hit your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you have any technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the Maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit your questions to today's presenter, simply type your question into the window, question window on the left-hand side of your screen and then hit the Submit button. We'll be answering as many questions as possible during the Q&A uh, that follows the main presentation, but please feel free to send in any questions you have during the, the presentation and we'll add them to the queue. Please also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the ASU website, uh, asumag.com, within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your console, the Dude Solutions logo is hotlinked, so if you want to visit their website during the webcast, you can click on the logo and a new window will open. Note that this will not take you out of the webinar. I would now like to introduce our presenters. Uh, Jed DeGroat is a customer service professional who is dedicated to helping clients achieve success. In his current role as Director of Client Services for the Education Market at Dude Solutions, he strives to create an environment where dudes can maximize the value clients realize for their solutions. He's passionate about Dude Solutions' mission, which is to empower employees and clients to do the best work of their lives. The vision is simple but powerful, better work, better lives. John Dufay is Executive Director of Maintenance and Support Operations for Albu Albuquerque Public Schools, the 31st largest public school district in the nation. His career started by working for a local design firm where he focused on high-end custom homes and small commercial and multi-housing project projects, later expanding into environmental issues and assessments. Mr. DeFay has experience working on ADA accessibility, energy projects, renovation and upgrade projects, and other assignments, including research facility and maintenance issues. William Glumack is currently the Director of Support Services at the geographically largest and northernmost school district in the U.S., North Slope Bor Borough High, uh, School District. He has a dynamic role in overseas maintenance operations, food services, transportation, and capital projects, while working hard to bring in data-driven decisions and pilot several state-of-the-art programs to address unique challenges his school fa district faces so they become the leader in innovative processes and maintenance. And with that, Jed, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Stephen, and uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're at across the country. We've got a really large audience here today, so really happy to be here with uh, William and with John to share with you some um, ideas and best practices on bridging the gap uh, of that knowledge transfer when there's employee turnover and uh, across your organization. So um, I'm going to go ahead and I'll run through the agenda real briefly, and then we'll dive into it here. So we already did the welcome and introductions. I want to lay the groundwork a little bit with kind of the reality of what the, we're facing today and the challenges with our workforce and um, retiring and, and turnover and, and those types of things. Uh, and then I want to dive in really at a high level and talk about uh, some best practices and solutions. Um, to that, how we can meet that need, and then really I want to I get into uh, where we can talk with John and with William, our featured client speaker panel, uh, and, and talk to them about some more specifics about what they've done to, to meet these challenges and overcome those. And we should have about 10, maybe 15 minutes at the end for some Q&A as well, too, so um, we'll be happy to take your questions as we, we get into that. So to, to start off today, I'd like to just kind of set the tone and, and get a, a feeling of the pulse of the audience here today and uh, ask a poll question. So if you could take a minute and just rate um, at your organization, uh, how would you rate the risk of losing institutional knowledge on a scale of one to five, with one being we're not really worried about it that much, um, and five being it's something that keeps me up at night. So um, rate on a scale of one to five where you're at with your organization. And if you can do that, we'll wait for about a minute here, give everybody a chance to, to put that in, and then we'll take a look at the results just to see where everybody's at here. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and we'll forward to the poll results question here, and we can see, you know, obviously with today's topic, there's going to be, uh, I think this is reflective of, of the current reality of where many ed educational institutions are at. A lot of people putting in at a three, four, or five is something that they're very concerned about um, at their organization. 
I'm going to give that just a, another minute here to populate so everybody can see that. Right now, 10% marked it at a 1 is something that they're not as concerned about. 25% um, marked it at a 3, 35% at a 4, and then 30% of the audience saying that this is a 5. It's something that they're very concerned about. So I think this is a, an accurate reflection of, of the current reality and where we're at with today's workforce. We look at a study from 2015 from Facility Management Journal. It showed that more than 50% of facility management personnel are expected to retire within the next 10 years. That retiring workforce is exerting a pressure that most organizations have never had to face. A high percentage of these professionals have been with their organizations for 20 to 30 years. Uh, that's a lot of experience. And unfortunately, in a lot of cases, there's been little done to document what they know, what they do on a daily basis, how they do it, all that institutional knowledge. And as organizations continue to make their operations lean, that's a trend that, that we're all familiar with nowadays, some of these retired maintenance personnel aren't being replaced. And even in cases where the organizations can't afford to replace them or do make that a priority, the fact is it's, it's becoming hard to find suitable replacements. So the average age of a facility management professional is almost 51 years old. So that reality is, you know, we do have an aging workforce. Not only is the workforce aging, there really aren't enough young professionals with the skills to take their place. Since there aren't enough facility management professionals joining the workforce to meet the industry demand, this really only adds to the sense of urgency at hand, um, dealing with knowledge transfer and, and bridging that gap. So think about, have you, have you really thought about the cost associated with employee turnover? Um, and there, there definitely is a hard cost associated with turnover, whether it's due to retirement or whether it's due to people moving to new jobs. There's definitely a gap to fill and a cost associated with that. Um, when people leave, that institutional knowledge leaves with them a lot of times. And the time and the resources that it takes to onboard a, a new employee or get that new hire up to speed can be months, a lot of times six to nine months or even more, depending on um, the aspects of, of their responsibilities. So just think about the time added that it takes for a new resource to do what their predecessors did, um, something that might have taken your former uh, head custodian or lead technician an hour might take their, the, their predecessor or their, the new hire up to four hours, depending on what that task is. So. When you think about your workforce as a whole and the cost of turnover, also need to think about some of the intrinsic value that those, every employee brings to that organization and what will be missed if they leave that organization. So every employee has institutional knowledge that they, they bring to the table. Every employee gains a lot of internal experience. Um, every employee understands the processes at your organization. If they've been there for a while and they've been working in that, they understand the pitfalls and they understand um, how to streamline and, and how to work those processes. And then really, you, you can't uh, understate the, the value of personal relationships, personal relationships with staff, with vendors, with students. And you have to think about the cost of, of losing all of this when there's turnover. When you think about this, it's natural to start thinking about the risk associated with losing that employee or those groups of employees. And with every instance of turnover, there is a cost and a risk of loss. With every employee turnover, um, there is a cost for that organization. And this impacts all, organization, all organizations across the board. So today, we've got a couple of subject matter experts with us, John and William, to talk about how to mitigate those risks. I'm going to dive in and share a few best practices kind of at a high level and more general discussion. And then I'm, I'm going to discuss with your peers how they've handled turnover and bridging that institutional knowledge gap. So to quantify that cost or when you're thinking about that, you have to think about different types of knowledge loss. And you know, when you think about what walks out that door, history of, of maintenance records. So if it's an employee that's been working there for 20 or 30 years and they know everything that's been done or all the different types of repairs that's happened, if it's not captured in a, in a digitized way or some way to pass that on, that, that's a significant loss. 
Um, knowledge about the building, you know, everybody has, uh, or a lot of organizations have facilities that are more than 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. And there's a lot of unique characteristics to each one of those. Um, if you don't have that information captured from somewhere, or like your asset data, the, the large asset components. I mentioned the relationships to staff and student and vendors and, and the impacts of that. So um, when you're thinking about uh, risk mitigation strategies, it's, it's helpful to think about these different types of loss. According to a, another study done by the Center for American Progress a few years ago, they said that it cost about 20% of an annual salary to replace a mid-range position. So for example, the cost to replace someone making $40,000 a year would be around $8,000. That's significant impact, and that doesn't even count all the different soft costs that could be associated with that. So what can be done? Well, knowing and acknowledging the, the current reality and situation is half of the battle. You know, now coming up with strategies and, and tactics to implement to, to combat that is next. So we know there's an issue with the current workforce reality, and let's talk a little bit about some of the best practices that we've learned at Dude Solutions from talking to clients over the years. So I'm going to, I'm going to share a few of those, and then we'll, we'll move on into our client panel here in just a few slides as well. So first, let's think about some of the most inf important information to capture from a facilities perspective. Um, the first step is capturing this important facility's information. Um, we look at these areas of, of what we hear most frequently about the most important and valuable information to capture. And I'll dig into each one of these a little bit deeper on the following slides, but thinking about compliance requirements, you know, risk mitigation, any standard operating procedures, um, getting work done right at the right time um, for PM and preventative maintenance steps, looking at asset histories, um, repair versus replace costs, um, building specifics, I, I hinted at that earlier, too, about unique characteristics of buildings. Um, the more that you understand those, the more efficiently you can work, and that increases productivity. And then employee performance, you know, just from a management perspective is, is another big thing there as well that's important to capture. So first, when we dig into compliance requirements a little bit, whether it's your capital plans, or whether it's your safety plans, or whether it's asset warranty information, all of those things that have historically lived in binders on a shelf, um, those binders of information can disappear. Um, they're not updated regularly. So really having something that's cloud-based to make sure this information doesn't disappear and that it can be updated on a regular basis. There's a lot of other benefits to capturing this information digitally as well, too, um, being able to empower people to access that mobile with applications. Um, being able to create reminders, um, a lot easier to monitor and, and update work as needed. Those are all benefits um, to moving this to a digital system, capturing those compliance kind of concerns. Um, next, you know, thinking about um, preventative maintenance. And, you know, when we often um, started promoting PM back in the day with clients uh, originally with School Dude and Dude Solutions, we did a lot where we promoted just bare bones schedule creation. Um, to get clients going, because there's so much be rich benefits to creating a PM program. Um, we focused a lot on the financial impact of preventing breakdowns and extending life cycles to those major assets. And so in the, in the thought of getting people up running quickly and easily, a lot of times we omitted a lot of detail in there. Um, again, just to kind of start realizing some of those financial benefits right away. But when you're thinking about knowledge transfer, though, you really do need to think about as much detail as possible in those PM schedules. So that, that can be a way where you can capture that institutional knowledge, and it can be passed on as employees retire or as they move into other positions and everything. So really you want to make this part of a, a, a new hire process, too, when they come in for their training and onboarding new employees. Just think about, you know, if you had all the documentation at a detailed level for your preventative maintenance program for your assets and your buildings, and you can include that in the, the onboarding process, how much better that would be versus learning on the job. Um, that could take a, a lot more time and um, a lot more resources. So one thing, too, utilizing mock inspections. Um, during the slow-ish time, I know there's not really slow times for any of us anymore, but um, whether it's the, the slower times maybe in December, at the beginning of January, over the summer, doing some mock inspections to make sure that you have uh, everything documented and really to identify where there's gaps and where solutions are new, needed. And at Dude Solutions, we do this for our disaster recovery process 
um, on an annual basis, actually a couple of times a year. And this year with the, the weather and the impact that we've had with hurricanes, we've had to implement that a couple of times. And, and good thing that we've done some of those mock inspections early in the year so we could identify um, gaps that we had. And, and we're not perfect, and nobody is. We're still working to improve, but, but doing those mock inspections helped to that end. Another important component that we talked about to capture is the asset history. Um, knowing what you have, every facilities department should have a list of all their assets and equipment ideally. I understand that's a big lift too, but having that asset information allows you to, to track repairs, um, your repair costs versus your actual cost of replacing that. It allows you to put that into your capital plan and integrate that with your operations. Just allows you to make better decisions overall. So capturing that asset um, information is, is definitely important, including, again, as much detail as serial code or serial number, barcode, any warranty details, all of those things are important to capture in there. And what we're seeing a lot of clients do now, too, if they don't have that list already of all of their assets, prioritizing you know, what's most important to get first, what's most critical that, that we need to actually capture and document. And then when we're doing our PM, let's uh, send out somebody, you know, either with a spreadsheet or with a a tablet, and then capture those um, serial numbers and capture the make and model and the different kind of categories and how we're going to enter that into our system digitally so we can make that um, something that's easy to update going forward. Also, when you're starting to get uh, renovation projects and new buildings that come, come in, establish processes and standards so when new assets are purchased, they automatically go into that system of documentation and everything. Doing that is going to allow you to maintain that list a whole lot easier, and that helps with the whole idea of the knowledge transfer going forward as, as people move on. Also, on a, a semi-annual basis, reviewing that data to see what kind of lemons are out there for your assets and looking at that repair cost versus the purchase cost and seeing kind of like an FCI, a facility condition index, but at an asset level. And when it gets above a certain percentage, then it's going to make more sense to replace that versus continuing to throw money at that. So building specifics, I mentioned that is another area that we see as clients are telling us is critical to capture for this, this knowledge transfer. Thinking about the unique characteristics of, of your buildings. How many buildings uh, do you have where the, the head if the head custodian left, you'd be lost with little understanding about where the major components of that building are or how to maintain them? Or think about everybody in the audience probably has a historical structure on one of their campuses that's over uh, 50 to 60 to sometimes over 100 years old. How many pitfalls or potential pitfalls are in those locations that aren't documented, that just live in somebody's head? Um, how much time would it take for a new employee to learn about all of those? So documenting what's specific and unique to each location, um, taking pictures, a picture is worth a, thousand, worth a thousand words, so taking pictures and associating that with a digital record, um, continue to build that out over time. And any time that there's something new that goes in in a renovation project or anything, make sure that that's documented and following that procedure to get building-specific information captured. So employee performance, that was one of the last main topics that we had uh, as far as feedback on clients from what's most important to capture for a, a transfer of knowledge when there's turnover. Capturing employee performance is really most critical for when your management team retires or moves on. Um, you know, consider what kind of training has your staff had, what kind of certifications um, do they have, what are the expiration dates for those. Think about their performance and um, how has that trend been over time. So some best practices uh, as far as managing performance is going through quality assurance checks, doing that on a regular basis. Um, getting buy-in from your employees and explaining why you're doing that and really utilize that data to train and, and to coach. If you're not doing all this and you have management that retires, all those trends, the, the coaching, the certifications, if none of that's been captured, then that new leader is really starting out behind the eight ball right away um, from the get-go. So capturing as much of this as possible uh, is really critical going forward. So if you're sitting there and you, you would answer as a three, four, or five on how concerned you are with knowledge loss and bridging that gap of institutional knowledge when employees leave, you know, do it self-assessment. And I'm not going to read through each one of these different bullet points here, but kind of think about those four areas that we highlighted, compliance requirements and preventative maintenance, 
your asset history? Do you have a list? Do you have a process in place to maintain that list or at least as new assets come in to get put into that, that list? Are you capturing unique characteristics about your buildings? And then what, what kind of processes do you have in place for employee performance and how you document that and manage that? So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead here and jump into our client panel here. So we're pleased to have, or I'm pleased to be joined by uh, two client speakers today. John DeFay, we mentioned earlier, with Albuquerque Public Schools, and William Glumack with North Slope Borough School District. Um, we've got some uh, Q&A time with them at the end as well, but over the next couple of slides, we've got about six or so questions. Uh, we're going to discuss with them to learn about their experience, lessons learned, best practices, and recommendations that they have, and what's worked well at their organizations. So just a little bit of background about each organization here. We really couldn't have two better to represent kind of the whole spectrum of uh, public K-12 organizations. Albuquerque Public Schools, among, one of, among the 40 largest school districts in the nation, um, nearly 84,000 students and 143 schools to maintain. And then we've got North, North Slope Borough School District, the northernmost school district in the United States, over 2,000 students, and 11 schools and eight villages. So John and uh, William, thank you both for taking time to, to talk with us this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you're at. <laughs> uh, good morning and good afternoon. This is John Dufay, and it's great to be here. And what a great, timely subject uh, as we're seeing this issue across the nation with uh, declining workforce uh, that are that are trained and qualified trained uh, workforce that uh, can slip right in it's one of the biggest things we're seeing right now is for management to have a succession plan in place so this is so timely of a subject matter and I'm sure everybody's having the very same issues Yep, thanks, John. Well, good. Well, let's go ahead into our first question here. And, and John yeah. and William, as we go through this, if you have other thoughts or ideas to tag on to what we talked about in the first half of the presentation, please feel free. Um, but love to hear from your experiences. I've visited with both of you uh, a good amount to know you have a lot to share with, with our audience here. So um, first, you know, what experience, can you talk a little bit about the experience that you've had in dealing with turnover um, and approaching retirements of facility operations professionals? And, um, John, I'm going to go ahead and, and let's turn this over to you first, and then, William, we'll, we'll get you here in just a minute as well, too. Well, thank you. Uh, boy, we're, we're, de we're dealing with this, and one of the biggest things we're seeing is just uh, institutional knowledge is a huge thing because institutional knowledge isn't just knowing the buildings. We've got 16.2 million square feet here in the district. And so it's, it's knowing when the building was built, knowing what some of those idiosyncrasies are of those buildings, what are some of the special requirements for these because there's so many different types of equipment, uh, and what are the people, what, what specially trained people do you have to have at certain schools to comply with new warranties and, and the certification to be trained by the manufacturer as these people leave. And just knowing, like like you were saying before, just the whole idea of of assets history, the compliance, the regulation, we're finding that these are things that are learned through time. And so now we're having a new challenge of how do you teach this in a succession plan in someone taking over? It, it, it is a huge issue for management trying to be seamless and in this day and time we're always trying to be seamless where it doesn't affect what's happening and i think one thing that's really really important to understand that everybody has to understand you know in a facility our job isn't to repair buildings or keep buildings going that's what we do but our our job really is to make sure we minimize any disruption in the classroom learning time in that educational process that's what we do, and how we do it is by doing our job of taking care of facilities. Yep, that's great. As well said, John William, um, can you talk a little bit about 
uh, the experience you've had in dealing with turnover at your organization and uh, how you're approaching the retirements of, of the facilities professionals? Sure, absolutely. So we are kind of a unique district in um, that we're about the size of the state of Minnesota. So for us, getting from one school to the next requires a plane ride um, and sometimes multiple plane rides to get out there. So we have kind of a distributed model for um, our maintenance staff out at each school where we have a plant manager at each site. Uh, and I bring that up because uh, the majority of my plant managers uh, are all within three to five years of retirement. Uh, well, about half wow. of them are looking at uh, retirement very closely. And the maintenance technicians that are kind of working underneath them are also in that in that nearing retirement age. So we are kind of putting in plans and, and working on the education side to actually partner with them to encourage students to move into the arena of um, uh, building management and, and maintenance because uh, we are uh, rapidly uh, approaching an area where um, we'll have facilities without adequate um, staffing and individuals there to uh, to maintain them. And given our unique situation, we have you know we have somebody in a building 24 hours a day because of the inclement weather conditions. And if we get a a boiler or a equipment failure in the dead of winter, it could uh, create uh, disaster uh, in the school. Yeah, absolutely. That So uh, most of your managers at each site are within three to five years of retirement. Um, and it's interesting and good to hear how you're trying to involve more folks in the workforce to, uh, to get up to speed so they can replace that. Just out of curiosity, is that in the form of kind of an apprenticeships or uh, internships, or how are you doing that? So we're, we're doing a, a combination of things. Um, we're doing an apprenticeship program with uh, contractors in the area. Uh, really, I went out and sought uh, partners um, from key contracting agencies to come in and help train our staff and, and provide influence for the, the individuals, the, the 20 to, to 30 year old individuals that we have in there that really don't have the skills, that didn't have a good CTE class in high school. And then in the high school level, we're bringing in um, interns. We are doing uh, modules and, and actually joint classes with our plant managers and so they can uh, really see and understand the challenges that uh, exist within the facility. And, you know, the goal here that I think the takeaway from this is that, you know, by starting at that age at any location, we're encouraging students to look at the fact that this isn't just a um, a career choice. This is a, a benefit going back into the community. This is actually a respectable position. We're not just, you know, guys in here performing operations. We're actually having, providing a, a huge service and value to uh, the communities around us. That, that's great. I love the way that you position that way. I mean, it really kind of ties into what John was talking about earlier about uh, you know, <clears throat> the, the mission and, and the role for uh, operations professionals at schools, and that is something that should be a respected position and everything. That's that's awesome to hear. Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. And, William, you kind of started to answer this already, so I'm going to throw this over to, to John. But, John, if you can talk about some of the different changes or some of the processes that you put in place to, to combat some of this um, knowledge loss when there's turnover. Well, I think one of the things that we're seeing is that when somebody leaves the way it used to be, you sometimes the next person in line would take over or do uh, within within the ranks. One of the things that we're finding is that the knowledge that everybody has to have that the that that a professional management person within facilities needs to have are the, the idea of being able to have engagement within the community, within the school board, within the school leadership team and have those and and also have the knowledge of their trade or what it is there uh, whether it's the whole building component but learning to be able to do accountability management so we're seeing these these challenges are so big that we're starting to try and put together management programs for people that are within the ranks trying to aspire to to uh, learn this and, and learn about accountability, budget problem solving. And so 
uh, doing the mentor programs where we're trying to take them out of their role uh, as a supervisor or something and, and putting them on a mentorship program with uh, to follow up and see what it's taking uh, to where they're gaining some knowledge because it, it's, it's the institutional knowledge that you really need to have and learn because you've got to have learn what those personal relationships are, what it takes to get things through, uh, working around the red tape. Cause there's always red tape, and you everybody knows you've got to be able to to do those things and that internal experience that you gain. So we're doing we're doing mentorship programs, as well as trying to work with some of the other uh, like, like the community college and, and people wanting to go into the management program, looking at the facilities association where they're getting certified, their training programs for certified building officials or and 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 supervisors. We're it, it's wide open right now. We're somewhat in a, I, I believe across this country within the building facility uh, managers, we're way behind the curve, and I think we're all trying to catch up, and we're looking at every direction. Yep, absolutely. That's good. I, I want to come back to some of the mentor programs and learn a little bit more about that. But before we do, uh, I want to give William an opportunity. I know you started to talk about naturally, William, some of the the cha some of the changes or things that you're doing to combat those challenges, as far as uh, engaging a younger workforce. And uh, is there anything else that you want to add to to this question, William? Oh, I apologize. I had my phone on mute. Um, uh, so we're also trying to utilize modern technology um, to address some of these challenges and uh, really try and take that that information that is stored in our um, uh, our workforce and moving it into an electronic form, uh, utilizing um, work order systems, uh, drawings, uh, documentation, and trying to move away from an area where um, all the information exists in, in tribal knowledge and, and just communication, but actually bringing that into a written document and uh, more or less developing a, a manual uh, for each one of the facilities. And I know that's not necessarily a realistic thing to do on uh, across a, a large number of facilities, uh, but creating some level of standard standardization across all the products so we end up with um, the same type of component. So really trying to, when we go in and renovate and modify facilities, uh, we're not relying, we're, we're identifying the fact that, you know, we know the workforce is aging, we know that there's going to be a mental, that there's going to be a, a handover process. And so shifting that into storing the, the information uh, digitally, um, yeah. Nice. No, that's that's good. That 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 makes sense. And uh, standardization, <coughs> moving that tribal knowledge um, into more of an electronic form. So, so I'll ask you, William, keep the ball in your court right now. From some of the changes that you started to make place on those, moving stuff uh, to standardization in electronic form, and and engaging um, the the workforce, uh, the younger workforce, and apprenticeships. Uh, have you started to see any unexpected improvements, or, or expected or unexpected? Can you talk a little bit about what you've seen as a result of that? Sure, absolutely. So we're, um, I'm relatively new in this um, position within the last uh, six months or so, and so we've seen a lot of rapid changes. And uh, so far, everything has been accepted with, um, you know, with open arms. Uh, we're deploying out, you know, standard things like a standard operating procedural manual um, that breaks down how to utilize certain tools and, and functionality. And we're seeing a lot of people that were initially very resistant to using technology in their arenas and actually welcoming it with open arms because they're seeing some of this value uh, with these products. That's the, the one of the biggest hurdles in uh, change management. But, yeah, if they're seeing value in it, then there's buy-in and everything, and then that helps things go a lot smoother. That's great to hear. Um, John, I'll, I'll shift this over to you from some of the changes that you've implemented um, and some of the mentor programs and, and working with some of the community colleges and some of the other things that you've done. Have you seen any unexpected improvements, or can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think one of the big surprises that we've had is not just necessarily uh, the 
cha uh, you know, changes in this. But some of the unexpected things that have been a lot faster and, and rapidly growing were, was the open-mindedness of a lot of the people, uh, people that have been doing this uh, in, in uh, you know, the system supervisors, people that have been doing this for a while that, that have, uh, you know, in, in those close days of retirement or whatever, you know, they're not as open-minded. It, it, you still have a lot of mentality in, in trying to change the mentality of saying, you know, this is the way we've done it for 25 years. Well, we're changing it. And, and that's really difficult to do. But we're finding one of the unexpected things, a nice thing, was a lot of the younger guys and people coming in have an open mind about it, and they're not afraid of the technology because everything we're doing now is driven, you know, it, it's the data. We're recording everything. We're putting everything in there. And as you know, we we have a huge thing of data, uh, uh, database uh, information. And so everything we're trying to do within our organization when there's a decision to be made on projects and things like that, we look at it from a data-driven decision-making. Sure, some things are still done with your gut feeling, but with a data-driven pattern of decision-making, we're seeing the younger people are able to make decisions and without having necessarily all that institutional knowledge, they can look at these at the data that's happening right now, and all that data makes it easier for the decisions to be made uh, from a practical point without having institutional knowledge as much as some of the elder people. No, that's a great point. I think you know when when you have that the power of that data, and we talked about it earlier. You have to be able to make sense of it and contextualize it and everything too. But but when you have that data, then you're kind of removing the um, the need to go with uh, your gut solely or, or uh, just go with something subjective. I mean, it's still important to gut check things, but but having that data, and especially um, for a younger workforce that doesn't have that knowledge, that that uh, makes sense to be a powerful thing um, for them. So good. Well. We've covered a little bit of this, but if there's anything that you can think of to add, you know, and, and William, when you talked about earlier um, digitizing some of the tribal knowledge uh, and information that's out there, um, what kind of institutional knowledge is most important uh, to get from your employees as, as you're looking at them facing retirement soon, and, and how do you go about getting that kind of knowledge from them? Sure, absolutely. So the methodology of collection right now has been a series of um, uh, really interviews. And we're in a unique situation, like I explained earlier, with our uh, having an individual that's been assigned to one facility for 10, 15 years. They know that building uh, better than uh, I know my parents probably. Uh, you know, that really in-depthly uh, know and understand the, the facility. So, you know, we, we, through a series of interviews, through working through them and developing um, long-term replacement plans and then collecting and storing it all into a, um, a common location. And like John had mentioned, you know, making sense of that data and that information, collecting it just for the sake of collecting it doesn't uh, provide any real value. And we actually have to translate it into um, either charts, tables, graphs, um, key learning points. Um, I have a background in project management. So, you know, oftentimes in project management, you have a lessons learned piece and developing a repository of lessons learned from different events and different projects. That's what we're in the process of, of really developing right now is um, how we can collect those lessons learned from the individuals, place them into a repository, and then opening it up for other staff to go in and, and pull that out and say, okay, the project was X, the, the preventative maintenance task was whatever it was, and ending up, you know, with uh, having a reference document that says, you know, okay, this is what we did, and this is what, what worked really well in the environment, and these are some of the issues that didn't work well. Thanks. Very good. John, what about you? What kind of instant? What would you say uh, some of the most important institutional knowledge is for you to capture from your employees, and, and what are some of the different methodologies you're using to do that? Well, I think one of the things we're really doing is is we have turned over 
and, and it's a very hard thing to do for managers and supervisors, but we're turning over a lot of the power to the technicians. We've empowered the technicians to do a lot of things. Uh, one of the things that we did uh, as a training tool and, and a tool for them to do their work better, but it also just changes a little bit of an attitude is we, you don't see our plumber going into a building necessarily with his wrench and a, and a, a channel locks or pipe wrench or whatever. They go into the place with a laptop and so do our HVAC. All of our technicians have laptops and they record everything that they're doing on the work orders. So we've empowered them to make decisions. We've empowered them to put the data in there. They still do the work, but we're finding out that 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 knowledge of, of, of as as we were talking previously, it, to to gather that knowledge and to gather the the data, have a data collection process. We're finding out by putting that data, giving it to the hands of the technicians that are there working, putting it into work orders and putting it into context to where they can we can do searches and we can pull that out and create databases. The technicians are doing a lot of the gathering in the work that they do every day. They don't look at it as, oh, go to the school and get collect a bunch of data. They're, it's in process of their work. So that was one thing that's been really unexpected also that we are getting from them because they're the ones that have the knowledge right now and they're putting it in document now and, and treating them and giving them the power to do it, to just say, you make that decision to do what you need to do instead of calling the supervisor. It's all in their hands. And so they've taken ownership. That is one of the biggest things because it is their building. They're actually putting a lot of data into that, into the database, like our, like our, our work order system, school dude, and things like that, to where we're gathering a tremendous amount of knowledge uh, and information we didn't know. That's awesome. I mean, empowering your employees, and, and I think for most people that go into this this industry and everything, I mean, they, they do it. They're mission-driven and mission-focused and want to make a difference at, at their community and, and working at an educational organization. So empowering them to be able to do that, that's awesome to hear that you're getting uh, great results from that. And doing it organically, too. So there's a lot of power behind that uh, of doing it organically and doing it yourself without um, – necessarily having to purchase services, although there's value in that for other other things too potentially, but doing that organically I think is, is really powerful too. That's great to hear. Um, so uh, just a couple more questions and then we want to uh, do a real brief review of, for Dude Solutions and then do some Q&A. It looks like we've had a few questions pop up from the audience here, but um, William, if you could just speak a little bit about what kind of recommendations do you have for other organizations that are facing uh, similar challenges to, to what you and John are facing. So I would I would probably say is you know start now start making changes or start looking at uh, your processes and how you can collect and use the data you have right now. Um, I you know early on in this process it's easy to be overwhelmed by looking at you know trying to okay how do I capture all this information and really it's just starts by a day to day practice and just you know picking one thing at a time and saying okay we're going to dig into this one issue we're going to try and collect information and then you know going back and making sure that what you know utilizing a, the work order system that you know, the proper data is going in there and you know, it comes back to that you know, garbage in, garbage out. Hey, we really want to make sure we're getting good information in this. Um, this information repositories are extremely valuable, provided the information going in there is, is accurate. Now, it's never going to be 100% perfect, and it's it's a goal to, to strive for that. But I think just moving forward and and really taking those first steps makes a huge difference um, for actually being able to. Um, develop a, a, and uh, formulate a, a program and then getting um, uh, like John said bouncing off you know pulling in that that organic kind of um, chemistry of having the a coming up from the grassroots type of a situation where you're actually having people interested in what you're doing um, and then pulling them in and making them feel like they are a part of it and that they are um, contributing to it and that they take ownership of it and I think that will end up in providing a better result on that because they may see challenges or issues um, or they may see a solution uh, in a process, 
that they that all they do is see solutions to this thing, but they don't their voice has not been heard maybe necessarily or they haven't had an outlet for it. So you know, involve the down to the technician level uh, early on into the development of these processes. Great, that's that's great stuff. Good, John. Uh, do you have any recommendations for organiz well, other organizations facing these challenges? I, I do. I, I think you know we we, we still need to build within. You're always going to be looking to the outside and you're going to bring people in from the outside that have no institutional knowledge but and, and understanding of what the school district does and the business it's really in into education. And it's a very unique business uh, that there is. Uh, so you have to work hard to bring people, keep people inside and, and bring them in within uh, the, the ranks. But I think you need, one of the things that we're seeing with our success is I, I recommend bringing them to the table, bringing your staff, your technicians to the table on problems and get their input and listen to them and empower them, let them make decisions and getting their input and using it because then they start having that buy and then they see that they're important and they want to be part of that process. And I, and I think it, it starts giving them a, a, a different perspective from a decision-making process instead of just being a technician to go fix uh, an HVAC unit or something. I think they start learning the importance of data collection and, and putting data into there so they can see what the data says. And they start, it, it, it opens a different, a different viewpoint, totally what people have never, uh, a lot of technicians have never done before. And I think you need to start training your technicians in professional development now in, in, in supervisory, so not waiting till they, till they become one. Uh, because a lot of people think they're not going to be one all of a sudden you find out. Uh, we, we found out, I, I, I brought in two managers that I did that with and I had no idea they could be as good a managers as they were. I was kind of worried, but I kind of had no choice. I needed somebody. And I'm going to tell you, these two managers have been in there for about a year now, and I'm so thrilled because we we brought them in and took them to training before they became managers, uh, supervisor training and sending technicians. And people were saying, why, why are you sending them to supervisor? They're an HVAC guy, and one guy was an electrician. And, they have both turned out to be unbelievable because they caught on and they loved it and they really took it serious while they were in the trade. So I think professional development, supervisor training is important to it sparks somebody and somebody may find out they don't want to do it. And that way, you know, they're not wasting their time trying to be in there where others find out that's something they like. Great points, great points. One, one thing that I'm hearing from both of you, and it's a positive thing for everybody in the audience here too, but one of the keys to success when we're talking about um, bridging that gap between uh, losing institutional knowledge and employees now and retiring uh, is empowering your employees. I'm hearing that loud and clear from, from both of you, and you know, for, for everybody in the audience, you know, that's something that um, is, is an option of, of thinking about how you can empower your employees. I'm, just, I'm hearing that loud and clear from your, your comments, and that's really great. So, um, so finally, before we uh, close out and do some Q&A stuff here, um, William, we'll start with you. you know, do you talk to your team about or do you talk to the facilities uh, managers about a legacy? Do you think about or how do you motivate them to, to leave a legacy? Is that part of the conversation as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's one of those things that um, uh, really trying to I, I try to instill and I talk with my staff about uh, what they're doing here. It's easy for um, for us to get kind of discouraged or, or only see the world in, in within one area and say, well, all I'm doing is fixing a boiler. All I'm doing is repairing a leak. And it's like, no, the reality is we're providing heat for students in the school and we're providing for them to be able to uh, get in a comfortable environment, learn and grow. And in a sense, you know, we're we're helping to raise and foster the new generation. I would like to say that uh, I really have a passion for education, um, but I don't like kids, uh, which is, uh, you know, so I rectify that 
by uh, by working in the in the background and being able to help on this side. I couldn't be in a classroom. Um, I, I not I don't have that uh, that uh, in me to do that. But I really have a, a passion for raising up the next generation and trying to to you know provide with them what's better than what we have. So I bring in that that concept to people that we're we're doing more here than just keeping a facility going. We're doing more than just maintaining a building. Um, we're actually here to support the education. Uh, we rebranded our maintenance and operations department to be support services around the concept that we are providing support and, and services to the students and to the, the schools. You know, in our kitchen staff, they are providing the food and the energy that those students are going to need for the rest of the day when they go out. And, you know, we feed them breakfast and lunch every day. So sometimes, you know, we're, we're the one thing that's, that's keeping them going during the day. We have transportation. We're bringing them safe to the school every single day, uh, you know, picking them up from door to door in, in, in negative 60-degree weather uh, and getting them to the school site safely with, again, going around the, the fact that we are we're really here for the students and, um, and that the, the students may not remember that uh, uh, the technician was there working on a boiler. I mean, realistically, that, that shouldn't be what they re remember about it. But it's going to uh, that keeping those energy systems online, keeping the, the building comfortable and warm makes a huge difference in their education. And, and they may not remember that, but they will remember the fact that the school was clean, that it was warm, that they had a nice environment to be in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's powerful the way that you position that, too, with, with the team. That's good. John, can you talk a little bit about how you motivate your team to leave a legacy? <clears throat> well, well, I'll tell you, that it's, it's almost the same. It, we changed our our name and stuff like that, support services, a number of years ago. Uh, people still relate it to M&O and things like that, but we're really support services, just like uh, it was previously stated. And, and I think it's really important. Every school district has an academic master plan. And, and everything we do should and does support the academic master plan. If you're doing something outside the academic master plan to support it, you're probably doing something that you don't need to do and you're doing it wrong. We've changed our culture and, and the guys are buying into it is that we're a partner with the schools. We are not something else. We're, we support the school. We support the academic plan. We're there just as much as, a, as as the teacher, as a nurse, or anything else that we've changed that culture for the guys to understand. One of the things that we've done, example, is when my roofers go into a school and they see a roof leak, I don't want them to say, hey, there's a roof leak, I need to go fix it. Their attitude is they're going to look at that roof leak and see that roof leak and say, that Roof leak is going to interrupt the classroom learning time, that educational process. I need to go fix that. That's what. That's why we do our job is to stop the interruptions and minimize them. So how do we do it is we do it by doing our job, whether we're a roofer, electrician, a custodian, a bus driver, whatever it is, and that's what's happened is this has changed the attitude of our guys. They're looking at it that they're just as important as somebody else there. Plus, you know, kids have to understand. If you think about it, the, as most kids, the first person they see is going to be the bus driver in the morning and the last person. And if they don't take the bus, the first person they're going to see most likely is the custodian. And so these are images and these are lasting thoughts that the kids see. And so we want these guys, these guys to have that personal uh, outlook that this is my child, this is my grandson, this is my neighbor's kid. So changing the attitude and the culture of your support systems is so valuable and so important that the value that you have is, is, is priceless. We're, we're seeing a change of our technicians who take a personal care of this now. It's, it's been amazing. And that's another totally unexpected uh, benefit that we have seen, and I'm sure uh, – you know, when you do that, you, you, you end up getting those extra little hits that we really appreciate because we never expected that. Yep, that, that's great. And both of you do a, a, 
the way you message that and everything, a fabulous job and, and motivating to leave a legacy. That's that's outstanding. I'm going to run through these next couple uh, relatively quickly because I want to have a few minutes for Q&A if there's, if there's some questions out there. So, uh, John and William, if you can hang out with me for just a few more minutes here, uh, just to give a quick overview of Dude Nation. Um, got over 11,000 clients under our belt now. We serve a whole lot of different suites here. Um, can help provide different solutions for your organization. Let me move this to the next one. So work and asset management is a lot of what we've been talking about today, but energy management is another area that we serve. Um, facility event management, technology management, and safety management, whole suite of solutions. And uh, if you'd like any information, any more information on any of those, um, I'll have a poll question here in just a second that you can fill out. For any of our product solutions, what's included with that? Um, obviously, it's cloud-based. We were one of the first uh, to go software as a service um, almost 20 years ago. Unlimited users and, and automatic releases and updates that go out to your solution. Mobile applications, so you can access your information wherever you're at. Um, you know, everything's got to be accessible on mobile now. We're a mobile uh, technology world. Um, so tab tablets, smartphones, all those things would be able to integrate with that. Um, our support and our implementation is... is top-notch, um, second to none, so our professional services, whether that's consulting services coming on site, we have our virtual uh, classroom trainings that we do as well, and then our legendary support team providing you lifetime support for your solutions. We do have some other professional services that we, we have recently introduced uh, in the last uh, couple of years, so data collection, getting those building or facility or asset lists, and we can come on site and do that doing facility condition assessments. We do have some preventative maintenance schedule creation, PM first step services. Uh, everybody that we talk to understands, uh, for the most part, the value of PM, um, but getting that up and running sometimes can be a challenge, so we, we do offer services now for that. Also, data migration services. So just looking at uh, implementation and beyond some of the different steps there as well, too. Um, I want to go ahead and move this to our poll question next. So if you want any more information, about any of our solutions, please go ahead and fill this out here. And then uh, we're going to move this to our, our Q&A session here in just a minute. Yeah, while you guys are answering the poll, <clears throat> if you do have a question, you can also submit that as well in the, in the question window. Uh, we've got a few queued up already, so uh, we can probably go ahead and jump jump in. Great. Um, and, people, and just, you know, if you want to tackle the poll just whenever you're ready. Um, so uh, the other thing I would ask is, is as you are listening to the Q&A, um, if you would take a moment for us to complete the feedback form that appears at the bottom of your screen, uh, that is very helpful to us going forward in, in how we handle our webinars. Um, so it looks like our first question, uh, what software are all of you using to manage the daily report duties of your facility managers? Are you able to use the same system to capture both the work orders in general as a process manager tool and the requests emanating from the schools themselves? Uh, this is John. Right now we're utilizing Dude Solutions, the school Dude, uh, a number of different modules with them. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's been great because we have accessibility to it at all times and our technicians have it. We're able to do, uh, you know, the, our forecasting with that based on where we've had lots of uh, uh, troubles and where we've had problems where we're looking to do replacements instead of repairs. Uh, energy management tool uh, is one of those things that obviously uh, we can predict exactly what we're, our electricity usage and where we have hit. So it, it, it is a, a full suite, but it's not necessarily trying to, about that. It, it's about how powerful it is, how it lets you make decisions. It gives you that information back. There's so much information, it, a lot of it's just noise, and you've got to know what information you're looking for. And I think this makes it really easy to help find that data and separate it from the noise and stuff that you really need. The next question. Hey, is, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, uh, this is William. We use the uh, Dude Solutions um, platform as well, and John said it really well, that it does a great job of uh, shifting out the noise and the nonsense and really focusing in on what the um, – um, being able to drive uh, decisions based on the information. 
Okay. Um, do you store your drawings uh, and O&M manuals electronically so that all of your techs can uh, access them? Yes. We put all of our drawings online to where they have accessibility to them and uh, use them when they're out in the field. And the other ability that they have, because they all have tablets, uh, all our types, they're able to put notes on those also where something may not be and, and, and do it like an as-built or where we've made changes or where they find problems and we're able to put little notes on them and then send them off to uh, uh, the supervisor or manager to bring it as a heads up item also if need be. All right. Yeah, we do the the same thing. We've got an online program that uh, houses all of our um, all of our data or all of our drawings and uh, OEM manuals. Okay. Uh, next question: uh, How does your solution compare to uh, Maintenance Connection? Go ahead, William. Uh, I've never used maintenance connection, so I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure. We we've looked at a lot of different ones. We've been doing uh, dude solutions now. I think since 2005, somewhere around there, uh, that we started, and uh, it it's you know it, it's powerful. It does what we need. The thing that we like about it is, is is the customer service. When we do have problems, we're able to get a hold of people uh, right away and, and talk to a live person and walk us through or walk make technicians. I've had technicians have problems and we tell them to call and they, they call there and they get they get answers. It, it doesn't have to be one contact person from our side it has to do all the connection. We're able to have our technicians call and do things. So it's it's pretty you know, uh, very customer friendly and and all about customer service. Yeah, to add to that, um, so this is my third district in the state of Alaska, and the third district where I have implemented the Dude Solutions platform. All three locations are very different um, areas, and I like the uh, the modularity of the way it's set up. Uh, my first district in the, the farthest south in the state of Alaska, we didn't need all of the, the components that they offer. Uh, we just needed a handful of them. Um, and then I was at Anchorage School District for three years, uh, which is the 103rd largest school district in the country right now. And we switched over to the Dude Solutions platform and picked up mo several of the modules. Again, not all of them. Uh, and like John was saying, that the, the training and that the ability for the technicians to pick up the phone and call and, and seek support was significant. So we went away from actually we dropped three administrative assistants that were there to support the work order program and eliminated all, well, actually just shifted it into different roles, but, but went from three admin assistants and a supervisor down to just one uh, coordinator to oversee the program. Uh, because they could pick up the phone when they had challenges and issues and just call and speak directly to a representative that was able to help them walk them through the challenges. So it, we saw a huge difference there um, for the, the staff uh, just based on the customer service alone. And then, again, the modularity of just being able to add the components that really applied uh, to the district. One thing I, w I do want to say is, you know, in, in the world today, if you don't have a powerful system uh, and, 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 and a whole component suite, there's no way in the world you can do knowledge transfer. There's absolutely impossible today with today's technology of the equipment and, and of the schools and, and all as we're growing and the idiosyncrasies of all that. Without a powerful suite, you cannot truly have knowledge transfer. It's, it's, most of it's going to be lost if you don't have something uh, like that to be able to assist you and really be the driver in the brains and, and you just pull out that information from that. Without it, you're, you're, you'll be lost. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, I, know I realize we're running over time. I think we uh, will probably wrap it up there. Um, I wanted to uh, take a minute to thank our speakers, uh, Jed, William, and John, and uh, of course our sponsor, Dude Solutions. Um, as a reminder, if you uh, register as a group, please add the names and emails of all in attendance on uh, the exit survey that we mentioned earlier. Uh, and also a reminder that uh, if you missed any part of this uh, program and you want to go back and uh, check it out again, or if you just want to review it, uh, it will be available on uh, ASUMag.com. In roughly a week, you will receive an email notifying you. Uh, other than that, uh, on behalf of American University, uh, I hope you have a productive remainder of your day.